Exhorters. Okay, now we'll wake up. Y'all got quiet on me again. I got to get a drink of water. Okay, exhorters. Here we go. Passion. You think exhorters are passionate. Hmm. People. Hope and reconciliation. Unity. But I would say people, 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 people they love. People. God designed them that way. You know? Don't try to change the design. I remember that's what I learned in homeschool. God made weekly bodies. Don't change the design. Exhorter, they're like the fourth day of creation. Lights in the sky, sun, moon, and stars. They set the times and the seasons. They're like the sons of Issachar. They know the times and seasons, knowing when to move, when to not move. If you plant in uh, November, if you start planting your tomatoes in November, they will not do well. I don't know in South Georgia they might, but North Mississippi, they're going to die. So you got to know the times and your seasons. Know when to plant, when to harvest. That's important for the exhorter to know the times. They, uh, <clears throat> it's the heavens that causes the tides to rise and fall. Did you realize that according to the moon? The moon moves the water in the earth, and that's the exhorter. They are called, God created them to move people. God created exhorters to love and move people. There's a purpose in that. It's not just to have fun, although they know how to have fun, but it's that fun that draws people, right? Everybody likes party. I do. I want to go to their party. They bring people. They govern, the heavens govern the times and the seasons, sheds light on creation and sheds light on all the gifts. It's that exhorter that can come and create a gathering and then they understand when it's time for you and when it's time for you. And then when it's time for them to be quiet and someone else speak. They understand that. They, move, they shed light on the gifts. They can take what that teacher has dug for months and brought out this nugget, deep nugget of truth. And then that exhorter light can shine on that and it will burst into flames and everybody says, oh, I get it. That teacher will take about two hours explaining and we went here and we went here and then we got this and then we did this. And then you hand it off to an exhorter and they go, bam! And everybody says, oh, I see it, I see it, I see it. And the teacher's over here saying, I've been saying that for a while. <laughs> That's true. We need that. We need the teacher to dig, but we need the exhorter to explode it. They don't see any boundaries. They just see people. Black, white, green, or yellow, they don't care. Government, beggar, whatever, it doesn't matter to them. They don't see the boundaries. They just move past those boundaries. Sometimes they need a boundary with their mouth, they can say things, noisy in space, constantly declaring the glory of God, no limits to his glory, no limits, no boundaries, lots and lots of words, but what's it for? What is it for? The glory of of God to expand his kingdom to release his words of wisdom that he gets for the teacher teachers and exhorters don't necessarily get along real well you know why because the enemy doesn't want them to because if that exhorter can sit quietly and hear the wisdom and the depth of that teacher and then take that and explode it without boundaries to the earth what would the glory of god look like the synergy of the gifts is so important we've got to understand and appreciate and value 
what the other gifts have because they will drive you crazy if you don't. They irritate me. Move faster. We got to move. But that's not a sure foundation you're moving on and you're going to fall. Be careful. Listen. Exhorters, you're the people movers. That's how God made you. Jeremiah, Moses, Paul, it's about the people and the light. They are world changers. They are people movers. They bring unity of reconciliation at a high level. You know, you go to a party and you don't like this one, you don't like that one, that one over there, but that exhorter comes in and everybody starts having fun and you're sitting down next to somebody that you didn't think you liked and next thing you know, and you're not looking at each other. You're at the same table. It's the exhorter that can pull all these units together to bring the unity quickly discern the heart of others and quickly open their hearts people love exhorters they'll begin to open their hearts and tell and listen to exhorters but the question is what are you going to pour in when that heart's open weak water are you going to pour in the new wine of the holy spirit that you have spent time Wine takes time. Water's easy. So what are you going to pour in? Water or wine? Let God change that water to wine. But it takes time, exhorters. Time, and you're always moving forward in a hurry. Have twice as many words as others. How many stars are in the sky? Never like to be alone. They want to see the faces of people. They just love the faces, and they love it when the people smile at them and say, wow, that's wonderful. They don't see boundaries. It's about the light exhorters. Fourth day, lights in the sky, colored lights, sun, moon, stars. We've all got the problems. They do not like to be alone. Paul said in his last book, first chapter, three times, and everybody has left me alone. Three times he said in one chapter. Have many, 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 many words, but they don't have very much to say. Usually operate in the nick of time. Woo! I'll be there. I can do it. I've got a daughter who's an exhorter. Nick of time. Cause others to wait on them. They can start projects without being prepared because they see it and jump and go. Click. Quick to jump in. And then, whoops, this isn't working. Let's just jump over here and go another direction. <laughs> Tyranny of the urgent. Ah, not planning ahead. We're going to talk about the giver. And she was, t my friend tells me, your lack of planning is not my emergency, right? Not so for the exhorter. Everything's their emergency. And sensitive to criticism, and they take offense very easily. They dislike being uncomfortable or the hard stuff. They have a deeper still, too. They prefer the easy way out and can get it wholesale. Don't want to pay the hard price. The hard price exhorters. But I have a question for you. If the world needs hope, what kind of situation would the hope be in? It's fine to give hope when you're at a party and everybody's happy. But in the darkest, deepest places, where's the hope? The hard places, where's the hope? Where's the hope exhorter? If you were the one that God said, you're going to bring the hope, what kind of hopeless situation are you going to be in? to give the hope, and will you have it to give? Moses, he tried the easy way in Egypt, killed a man, 
He spent 40 years in the backside of the desert. It was a hard place. He was born for glory. He was born to release the glory. He was born to lead his people out of Egypt. And he knew it. I think his mother probably told him. And then what's he doing on the backside of the desert herding sheep until a burning bush came along? And then when he went back, God said, what's in your hand, Moses? Well, it's a stick, a shepherd's rod. When you die to yourself, when you spend that time in the wilderness, in the darkness, when there's no hope, God will say, now you're ready. What's in your hand? And watch what I can do with a stick. He had had a scepter. He had had the clothes. He had been a prince. But now he had a stick. But I'm telling you, he had a stick. In the wilderness... After they came out, his address was the tent of meetings where he met face to face with God because he learned what the face of God looked like in the desert. And he became addicted to the face of God. And the people didn't matter so much anymore because all he wanted was the face of God. And he moved the nation out of slavery. He moved from burning bushes to burning mountains. Dramatic, yes. Amazing, yes. Hard place, yes. Was known as the meekest man on earth. Moses, prince of Egypt. The meekest man on earth was Moses. You know why? Because the people's faces built you up. But when you know the face of God, you are in fear of his glory. And you can't carry that glory unless you carefully know how to hold it. It's not something you toss around. He walked in the fear of the face of God. And he went to burning mountains. My friend, Jay, I'm telling you, I love her. She's so flamboyant. Can't help but love her. She always says, hello, beautiful. She is always dressed. She drives a gold convertible. But I'm telling you, when she... <laughs> When she worships God, when she is in the midst of you, I'm telling you, this woman, she's been to the pit of hell. She's been put down. She has paid a price. She's been on the backside of the desert, and she's meek. Oh, you can tell she's an exhorter when she comes in. She lights up the room. But then let her tell you about her Jesus. Oh, she brings the presents because she knows his face so well. It's about whose face are you addicted to? Do you put immediate pleasure over the long term, the easy way out? You don't like discomfort. I'd rather do it this way because I don't want to pay that hard price. Do you skirt the issues, not accepting responsibility for your failures because it's always somebody else's fault? I didn't do that. It was because my sister did this, and that's why I did that. I know. I have one. Ask why me? Why is this happening to me? It's so hard. Oh, exhorter, why is this happening to me? I'm telling you, your value will be seen by the depth of the wilderness you walk through. You walk through hell, you're going to have authority over it. 
but you got to walk through it to get it. Exhorters pay the price. You know why? We need to see the glory of God in the earth. We need the hope in the darkest places. And you're the one God says, you've got it. Let me hone it. Let me shave that diamond until you sparkle. So you can release that glory. Relationship above purity. Cut the corners. Easily addicted to the approval of people. And confronts Jezebel. Says, guess what? You don't have to pay that hard price. I can get it for you wholesale. You don't have to go the hard place. We'll find an easy way out. Candlestick. Jesus is the light. Sheds light on the teacher. Sheds light on the incense of the giver. Sheds light in the whole tabernacle. Is lit up by the exhorter, by the menorah, by the light. But the issue is not the light. It's the purity of the oil. Any oil won't do. You've got to go all the way up to the Golan Heights. You've got to get those olives when they're just ready to pick. You got to bring it down. It was a four day journey up, four day journey down. That's why we have Hanukkah. This oil had to be pure. When you purify olive oil, the first crushing is the purest oil. And that's the only oil that could be in this. The first crushing, get the word crushing. The purity of the oil is the issue. For the menorah, it is not the light, it's the purity. Exquisitely prepared, but it takes time. What? Time seasons, that's the exhorter, brings light to the whole tabernacle. But what's the answer? Be like Jesus. Embrace the pain of separation from people and their approval to spend time with the Father to know the character of your God when you cannot see his face. Because guess what, exhorters? You will walk through darkness to shine the light. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you pain. I don't understand that. Arthur says the exhorters are going to have to walk through some pain. I don't understand it, but I see it. When you cannot see his face, you're going to have to know his character. What does he say? Who am I? I will never leave you or forsake you. I am your shepherd. You will never have a want. I am Jehovah Jireh. I am all you need. I am Jehovah Shalom. I am your peace. Know the character of God that never changes. Sometimes you cannot see his face for the clouds and the darkness. But you're called to release light. And in those moments, you got to know his character. Feelings change. Character never changes. Jesus Spent time in the wilderness. Paul spent 17 years in the Arabian Desert. Hard place. But he learned who God was. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the Torah. He knew the word. But it took 17 years in a desert. My friend Norma says the word desert means to speak. He went out to hear God speak. 17 years. But when he came back, Moses spent 40 years. Jesus spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness. And you know what? Satan came to him, and you know what he said? I'll give you these keys. You can get them wholesale. You don't have to pay that price. I know what you came to do. You came down here to... Save all these people, but I can get you these keys. You came to get the king, keys of the kingdom. Isn't that what you were here for? Yeah. I can get them for you wholesale. You don't have to do that. Just kneel and worship me. It's easy. And Jesus said, no. Get behind me, Satan. 
I don't want wholesale. You know why? You know why? Because you're worth full price. You're not a wholesale item. You're worth the full price. He said no, and he didn't take the easy way out. So on the cross. Hmm. On the cross, wow. This is your deeper still. It got dark on the cross. Let me tell you about Paul on the, and his deeper still. And then we'll talk about Jesus' deeper still. Paul, Silas, wonderful exhorter. 17 years in the wilderness, knew the face of God. He was going place to place to place, releasing the glory. Oh, my goodness, the evangelist Paul. But in that dark place, he and Silas had gone, and they pulled them aside, and they beat them till they looked like hamburger meat. And they threw them in jail. And they're laying there. Man, I thought we were called to the world. This ain't good. It's uncomfortable. Pain. Bleeding. Hurting. Not understanding. But here's what Paul said. Silas. Yeah, Paul. Let's sing. What? My back's hurt, Paul. Yeah, but you can still talk. Let's sing, Paul. Let's sing. Sing in that dark prison. Now, that's evangelism. Because everybody in the whole prison got saved. Because in that dark place, in that deeper still, that exhorter, Carried the hope. Sing. Jesus in the dark place. It was dark at the cross. Every demon in hell was at the cross. The king, the prince of darkness, of the atmosphere, was at the cross. It was dark. That word darkness is used three times in the word. It was dark over the face of the earth when God spoke light and chaos aligned. It was dark in everywhere in Egypt, but there was light in the land of Goshen. This light, this darkness, you cannot light a candle and see it because it's tangible. And there was that same darkness this day on the cross. And nobody could see. And Jesus, who had always beheld the face of his father, always had seen his face, never been separated, couldn't see start and the prince of darkness came up with those keys rattling the keys you know I could have got it for you wholesale you didn't have to be here in this darkness curse the darkness and die curse the darkness and die but our great champion reached down with the hope of the exhorter. And when he cried out, my God, where are you? But then he knew. Then he knew. You said you'd never leave me or forsake me. You said you were the great I. You said you are 
the Jehovah Shalom, my peace. You are Jehovah Jireh. You're all I need. You are the King of glory. You have it all at your disposal. So he faced the darkness and refused the keys. Not because he could see the face anymore, but because he knew the character of his God. And he could walk through the darkness, never stopping, so that he could step into the light and he could say to you, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you, give you peace. Because of this on the cross. Exhorters, you got to go deep. We're going to need you. We're going to need the hope. Your words will be bright lights of wisdom. Your legacy will be the magnitude of your glorious message and not the number of words it took you to say it. You'll know your God face to face. You will reveal his knowledge, his character, his wisdom in the season that you live in. You will see and release the jewels from the word of God that the teacher gets. You'll build relationships across boundaries. You will know and understand the times of the seasons. You will have evangelism at its finest, even in a dark prison when you're bleeding. We're going to play a little clip right here. This is for you, exhorters. The ninth week of training is referred to as Hell Week. It is six days of no sleep, constant physical and mental harassment, and one special day at the Mud Flats. The Mud Flats are an area between San Diego and Tijuana where the run water runs off and creates the Tijuana Sloughs, a swampy patch of terrain where the mud will engulf you. It is on Wednesday of Hell Week that you paddle down in the mud flats and spend the next 15 hours trying to survive this freezing cold, the howling wind, and the incessant pressure to quit from the instructors. As the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, my training class, having committed some egregious infraction of the rules, was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each man till there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud if only five men would quit. Only five men, just five men, and we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around the mud flat, it was apparent that some students were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun came up, eight more hours of bone-chilling cold. The chattering teeth and the shivering moans of the trainees were so loud, it was hard to hear anything. And then one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised in song. The song was terribly out of tune, but sung with great enthusiasm. One voice became two, and two became three, and before long, everyone in the class was singing. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud if we kept up the singing, but the singing persisted. And somehow the mud seemed a little warmer, and the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. If I have learned anything, in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope, the power of one person, a Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. So if you want to change the world, start singing when you're up to your neck in mud. That is the anointing of an exhorter to release hope when you're up to your neck in mud or you're in a prison or you're on the back side of the desert hope of the exhorter will shift the nations so we thank you for exhorters we say welcome exhorters. I'm telling you with all that's going on in the earth today, it's you exhorters who are going to be singing the songs of hope and glory. So we say exhorters, welcome 
to the table. We're really glad you're here.